This is Tepito. Throughout the country, it's known simply as the Barrio Bravo, the roughest neighborhood in Mexico City. It's lived through the Spanish conquest, the revolution, and devastating earthquakes. It's the oldest part of the capital, and it survived by playing to its own rules. The international black market and Mexico's powerful criminal groups operate with impunity in this labyrinth of back alleys, closed courtyards and crowded streets. We're here to dig deep into Tepito's closely guarded secrets and to find out how its reach extends across Mexico and to the world beyond. This is a good place to start. This huge market is the heart of the neighborhood, but it's more than just a collection of stalls. This is where Tepito connects to the global underworld. These crowded streets are notorious as the place you can get almost anything, if you're not too worried about where it comes from or if it's legal. Outsiders don't film here, at least if they want to get out with their camera and their clothes. Gangs of robbers and kidnappers are a real and prevalent threat. But we're under the protection of neighborhood strongman Santos, who like all the traders we met, didn't want to reveal his full name. He's one of a long line of Tepito street sellers who have been hawking their goods since before the Spanish conquest. Tepito has made us traders, and it's always been that way, since the times when you would say, hey, come and get a slave, or come and buy my canoe. Now, the merchandise is ripped off sneakers, imitation designer clothes, and fake luxury bags. The traders, too, have had to evolve to survive. In a rapidly shrinking world, they've turned from local sellers to international entrepreneurs. In the back room of his store, Santa's friend Manuel outlines for us the global black market network. We jumped from Laredo to Los Angeles. Then many more went to Panama, then to New York, and you could earn still more money. Then people started going to Korea. After Korea, then we jumped to China. I went there for the first time 15 years ago. Now we don't go so much to China, because now a lot of Chinese export their merchandise to Central America. There in Belize, you just order the products, and they send it in trailers, and it just arrives in Mexico. They contact you, and you go for your things. So how do the tons of illegal merchandise arriving by air, sea, and road get past Mexican border authorities. Tepito inspires the authorities to become corrupt. The authorities have to turn the blind eye, and we have to give them the money to do so. Once the goods arrive in the market, they disappear into a labyrinth of concealed tunnels and secret warehouses. The casual visitor catches only the merest glimpse of a complex world. This it's just one of many hidden rooms above Tepito Market. And the discs that are being burnt in these rooms are not just sold in the market, but they're distributed throughout the country. Tepito's position in the capital makes it easy for it to export its products across Mexico. Policemen here admitted to me privately that they're powerless to control this swarming, illicit anthill. They're just here to look out for thieves. We're autonomous. We're not governed by the law or the authorities. As we dig deeper into the Barrio Bravo, we realize that knocked off brand names and fake luxury shoes are not all that's coming into or leaving Tepito. There are far more deadly goods being imported from around the world. We've just made contact with a weapons dealer who has his business inside the main Tepito market. So we're gonna go in now and talk to him. He asks to remain anonymous as we talk in the small t-shirt stand he uses to meet potential clients. If I wanna buy a gun then in Tepito, how, how do I do it? I take my phone out, I'm gonna to say to you, what of this you need? 
I have this one, I have that one, I have this. It's like a catalog. See, si, like that. His best sellers are pistols like this one. It's their bulldog. For larger caliber weapons, he relies on a constantly fluctuating supply line from China, Russia, and especially the US. Do you have any idea how they get across the border? Los carteles de, de Estados Unidos. The cartels in the US and the border zone, for example in Tijuana and Tamaulipas, they are in control of the arms traffic from the US to Mexico. A battle between Mexico's government and rival cartels for drug routes and territory has meant a growing demand for weapons. We've discovered that Tepito is a major supplier. And when the cartels come to here, they're looking for the big guns. They, look, they come in with money. For the many groups in conflict, Tepito is a free market zone, a safe place to buy in bulk. Todo ese tráfico y las rutas they're fighting over for the narco trafficking route, so it's easier for them to come to Tepito. When there's war, when someone is fighting over an area, they want arms. For example, with the situation in Michoacán two or three months ago, all of the people from Michoacán were here. Tepito doesn't just supply guns, but also men to pull the trigger. Just before our visit, this flyer was put up in the neighborhood, apparently by the powerful Gulf Cartel. They offer big dollar paydays and a way out of Tepito to those willing to join them. This wall is covered with young men who have accepted similar offers. These are all the boys that were from the neighborhood, but unfortunately fell into bad ways, and they killed them. So their friends and families got together to paint the faces of all those who died. Jorge Berra, one of Tepito's boxing champions, has lived here all his life and understands what drives many of the young to become criminals. If you're a young man who has a wife and family and there's no work in the neighborhood, the easiest way to work is on the wrong side of the law. The cartel's demand for foot soldiers has increased as they continue the protracted struggle against each other and the Mexican government. To find out how Tepito meets that demand, we've been trying to make contact with a hitman who's operated from this neighborhood for more than 20 years. But when he finally agrees to meet us, in a small room above the market, we're all apprehensive. It's like it came into fashion, killing for money, since exactly six or seven years ago, when all this began. Sometimes, because they already know each other, they want someone who can come in who people won't recognize, like a tourist, and who can kill when it's least expected. He's traveled across the country, contract killing. They took us to Monterrey. We arrived and the door to the house was open. My partner got out his gun and shot him in the head with a 22. I was sitting down, looking at the victim, who was in agony. I took out the machine gun from my back and shot him twice in the head, because they told me they wanted two headshots. He bears the marks of his trade. One of the people I was working with betrayed me, and I was kidnapped. They cut off my fingers. I got several knife wounds. We gave him some money and I got free. But later we found out who they were, and we killed them all. There are, because there are a lot of boys who take drugs and have guns and ride motorbikes. They start robbing, and then they get hired and begin killing. At the end of our meeting, I ask him if he thinks what he does is wrong. Could be wrong, but the truth is, whatever, it's a way to live and work. As he leaves, he tells me to call on him for anything I need taken care of. I believe him.
This community has survived through being able to meet society's demand for the forbidden. And as long as that demand exists, so will Tepito.